Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Rick Costa. I'm a social director of the Zuckerman Institute, which is the institute right next door. And I'm joined here today by Carol Becker, who's the dean of the School of the Arts at um, Columbia University. Uh, we have an event tonight that uh, um, is going to have the following outline. Uh, so first, Sarah Z will speak about um, her work, and then Richard Elsel will comment and enter a dialogue. And each of you should have gotten some cards. So if you have some questions that emerge during the event, please write on the cards. Someone will collect them and bring them um, to the this seating area, and we'll pose them to Sarah and Richard. So the Zuckerman Institute, that's right uh, next door, brings together researchers from many different disciplines that are interested in neuroscience and how the brain works and how it can generate perception or memories, uh, feelings, how it can generate action. And this idea of bringing together many different people uh, that are interested in the same problems uh, is, is supposed to then catalyze the generation of new ideas and new uh, approaches that will lead to new discoveries. One of the interactions that is perhaps not easy uh, to deal with is the interaction between the arts uh, and the sciences, and in particular between the arts and neuroscience. Uh, our own co-director, Eric Kandel, has dedicated a great part uh, of his uh, work and wrote a few books about the interaction between art and neurosciences. And um, <clears throat> last year, he started an experiment where he invited an artist, Jeff Koons, uh, to see what could come about these interactions. Uh, the result was good. And we were lucky enough to have a great institute supporter, Alan Kenson, who has been a loyal supporter of the institutes and had the great vision and generosity of creating an artist in residence program, of endowing it. And this program is supposed to promote this meaningful partnerships between artists and neuroscientists at Columbia. And uh, they can be at the Zuckerman Institute, but the location of this building and the Zuckerman Institute is not just a coincidence. We hope that it actually causes um, a change at Columbia uh, university. And we all think the creation of this artist in residence program places Columbia in a very special place as an incubator of interactive studies that will lead to transformative questions that hopefully can lead to new discoveries, but most importantly, change society. So we want to thank. Alan Kenzer, who is here tonight for his sponsorship. Please join me. Thank you. And this event tonight is special as it launches this artist in residence program, but it also commemorates Sarah Z as the inaugural Alan Kenzer artist in residence. And we hope it spearheads what would be a long-lasting collaboration between the Zuckerman Institute and the School of the Arts in general. And this event, we hope, is going to be 
the first of many at these two buildings here. So we're very lucky to have here Sarah Z, and we want to thank her for accepting these, and Richard Axel, who's the co-director of the Institute for this event. I promise you it will be a treat. I was asked not to raise expectations, but what the heck. <laughs> and so now I'll say a few words about Richard, and then I will invite Carol Becker here to say a few words about Sarah, and then Sarah will speak, and then Richard will comment. So Richard Axel is a university professor and a researcher at the Zuckerman Mind Brain Institute here and also a co-director uh, with um, Eric. Early in his career, Richard Axel developed gene transfer techniques that permitted the introduction of almost any gene into mammalian cells. And this approach permitted many discoveries, for example, the isolation and analysis of the receptor that the AIDS HIV virus binds to get into cells. Richard then, as a molecular biologist, switched gears and began to apply molecular biology to the problems in neuroscience. And Richard decided to tackle an interesting problem, the problem of smell. Maybe uh, many of you will be as impressed as I am that each of us has the capacity to distinguish from 80 million to a trillion smells out there. So can you imagine how does the brain detect all these different chemical compounds and combinations out there? It seems to me like an untackable problem, but Richard tackled it, and he cloned the molecules that these chemicals bind to, the olfactory receptors. And his lab then showed that each olfactory receptor, each of these molecules, is expressed in a single neuron. And most remarkable then, the neurons that express the same olfactory receptor somehow project to the same area of the brain. These findings uh, earned him many awards, including the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2004. But then Richard sweet gears once again, and he now focuses in understanding how the brain can impose subjective meaning to the representation of an odor. For example, how can an odor be perceived as pleasant or disgusting, depending on the context or by different people? Richard's also an avid art lover, an opera connoisseur, and really a quintessential intellectual. And he can also tell a good joke. <laughs> We're lucky to have him here tonight together with Sarah Z for this event, and I'd like to invite Carol Becker to come up and say a few words about uh, Sarah. Well, the School of the Arts is thrilled to be working with neuroscience and really excited. So this is, uh, this is it, our, our experiment. <laughs> you're, you're, the you're the witness. So Sarah Z's sculpture and installations exist in tension between the micro and the macro, the abstract and the concrete, gravity and lightness, the enigmatic and the obvious, liquid and solid. The work both creates and collapses space, alluding to drawing, painting, sculpture, and architecture, all disciplines that she has studied. The sculptural pieces appear to be either pulling the physical world apart, or taking the fragments that already surround us and spiraling them into a maelstrom of energy that holds the promise of reuniting these elements into a new order. Her wildly precise, site-specific installations 
utilizing everyday mass-produced objects create a new context, meaning and importance for these familiar entities, as well as new systems of classification, making us aware of their ubiquity in the construction of our lives. Her meticulous but playful approach also recreates the experimental process of the studio environment or the laboratory in the space of the gallery or museum, challenging the notion of what constitutes sculpture. But it is finally the participation of the viewer's eye and attention that unifies the experience and brings the components together to complete our perception. Extremely prolific, Sarah Z has been and continues to be commissioned to create major installations in the most prestigious museums and art institutions throughout the world. Her work has been collected by the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney, the MoMA, the Guggenheim, and many other major institutions, and increasingly selected to work in public sites such as the High Line and the 96th Street 2nd Avenue subway station. She most recently was commissioned by the Storm King Art Center to create a site-specific work which will be complete by spring 2020. Without losing any of her work's signature ephemerality, the astonishing drawings for this piece, which is all we have so far that we can see, it's called Fallen Sky, give the sense that it will quite literally ground the sky to the earth and bring the earth up to the sky. Sarah Z became a MacArthur Fellow early in her career, and the prizes and the accolades have continued to this day. And chosen to represent the US at the Venice Biennale in 2013, she created an intriguing multi-part installation called Triple Point, successfully transforming that oddly fragmented classical space of the US pavilion into an intriguingly unified inside-outside visual experience. About her work, the sculptor Richard Serra, whose massively heavy steel installations could not be more different from Serra Z's, has said that her work is like seeing Twombly and Pollock in space. In other words, a feat of both engineering and imagination. And a serious educator, Sarah Z is greatly sought after by our students in the visual arts program, many of whom are here tonight, I saw them. And her inquisitive philosophical and experimental approach to art production made her really the unanimous choice to be the first cancer artist in residence with neuroscience. So let's welcome Sarah Z to the podium. Let's get a slide up there. Let's get some images, because um, I'll, I'll start with a caveat that uh, language is a tool to talk about both of both art and science, I think, can be tricky, because words like construction, reality, abstraction, they have very different, very complex and specific uses uh, in both, I think, neuroscience and in art. Um, having said that, I think, should we bring the lights down a little, maybe? Um, I think that um, I'm going to, I put together a bunch of slides around a phrase that actually Richard said to me in our conversations before this talk, and it, it was a very beautiful phrase, I thought, um, and used in science, but translated to my work and to art. I think it's, it's, it's a beautiful phrase to actually uh, give this talk around. Um, and he said, he talked about the meaningful mapping of time and space. So um, that's what I, I chose these slides around. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, about three different works and that really talk to, to that idea of how do we map time and space? How does it become meaningful um, when I'm making work? And uh, obviously it has implications in neuroscience as well that Richard is going to describe because um, that's his medium. So this is the American Pavilion in Venice, and it is um, a Palladian-styled building, uh, which means that the idea was that for architecturally you would have a central, um, a central access where everything um, came from this kind of compass rose. I actually see it in this building too. I think Renzo has actually played on this idea that you stand in the middle of the building and you see every direction, right? So this is um, an old Palladian idea where you'd actually have a compass rose. And the thing that I did um, with, the bu with the building was try and actually throw that off to really play on the idea that actually there used to be columns of trees that frame this building uh, in a symmetrical way. But of course, as trees do, they died 
uh, and you have these incredible keys on either side, but all the others are gone. Um, and I changed the way that you entered this building, which has actually been now sort of kept uh, because we had to change the fire code on this door, a very mundane thing, um, and to come in to the side so that you would have an experience of architecture where it was this kind of unraveling over time and space that I knew was going to happen. It was directed by me. So I knew you were going to enter the building um, and what you would see first. So the first thing you saw was actually something that played on the compass rose. So there are three compass roses in this space. Um, and the first thing you saw was actually a kind, a kind of modeling of a planetarium. And in each room, the way you moved around the space, um, I was thinking that would be different. So that you didn't realize this necessarily, but the, the work was actually directing the way you move through the space. And this idea of sculpture in the round was very important to this space. So you see this is actually a mapping of the space and the scale of the space. And people asked, how did you, how did you do this and bring it in, in Venice? And, uh, what was the time around it? So what, what I did was I actually took this exact one-to-one -one compass, brought it to New York, and built two of the pieces in New York based on that scale. So it was a kind of mapping of the space um, that way. But the idea was that you would actually be funneled down into these like small into these actual smaller locations in space, and that you would have this sense of discovery in the space. Um, but actually, it's very choreographed. There's, these, there's real ideas in my mind about what are anchors for you to navigate the space and find yourself within the space. Um, one of the ideas was really important to me was actually how you enter and leave the space. So in most spaces, how you got to the door to lead through was actually part of the experience of the piece and was very choreographed. So this piece, you had to go around it. Um, to to get to the other side. In the next room, everything is different. The lighting is different. The gravity, in some ways, in my mind, is different. It's sort of dark, but you can't. Can we turn the lights down even more? Um, there's a string that leads to a rock right here. And that this everything in the room is actually angled to this measuring stick, if you will. So all of the sculptures are slanted to that angle. Um, and all the sculptures actually were very much about what was taken away in, this spa in that space. When you got into the next room, you see the actual compass rose. So this was the room that you were supposed to enter um, and, and find yourself in a centered space. But instead, this was the idea was it was actually in much more a kind of navigation that was more like, let's say, a Japanese garden where everything is choreographed in a more filmic way where you have an experience and then you have an experience and it's the, the meaning between those experiences um, that, that you find yourself in, rather than a kind of Versailles, let's say French garden, where you walk to the center and you realize, this is the place where I can see everything from. Um, and one of, the, one of the things that I like to do is use spaces that are not considered art spaces. So if you look here, this is actually a back closet, which I opened up and made into a showing space. Um, and if you look at what's here, a lot of it was found. Like this is this is the um, plate for Bruce Nauman when he was here. This is an Anne Hamilton book. And then a lot of it I went and got um, from the web to, and went and I got basically every biennial artist I, I got. And I'll just oops, I'll just show you. So this is the next room, but I was going to show you how things in the work that you might not notice actually are very operative in terms of the way you move through space. So this is a really important part of this piece, which is a pendulum, because you see it through all the rooms. That's your line of sight. Um, and when you enter this room, you are pretty much attracted, thank you, to the, um, now you can go to sleep too, if you want to. It's the best thing about art history class, right? So, um, so yeah, no, I didn't do that for me. Um, thank you. So um, this is a pendulum, and uh, uh, oops, sorry. Now I do need the light. Sorry. Yeah, there we go. So one of the things I like about this piece is that it's um, it is actually made by the tool itself. So the pendulum goes in first, and you can see there's the compass rose. And the, by swinging the, by hand swinging this, you actually make the piece. So it measures the space before the piece is created, um, and you build the piece up that way. So the piece as sculpture is actually like a, a tool itself. No, it's been, um, and it's just some other things about directional. Um, ways of leading people through space. So this actually has an opening, so you actually come here to see it intuitively. When I first installed it, it was open to the front when you come in. 
but I wanted that to be part of the reveal, that you would come in here, and then you'd move here, and you'd, and you'd experience it here. Then I wanted you to leave through this room here, and I actually made this art, the architecture deeper so that you didn't know it was coming around that side um, when you went to the next room. And so that transition between rooms and that opening of space is very much about this feeling of discovery. Um, another thing about, just quickly about site, site specificity, a lot of people say, oh, well, how do you install this somewhere else? This is actually going to be installed at the reopening of MoMA. Um, uh, and so we're, it's, it's actually quite easy to do. Um, this move from having this opening central to, slight, to slightly to the, to the left, um, the entire piece was installed, and I said, let's move it, and it took about three hours to do. Um, so, the, but the second part of it is that this mark right here is the only thing that hits the wall. This is where the pendulum hits the wall, so it's an actual measurement of how that interacts with the wall. And that one moment kind of locates it very specifically as a site-specific piece. So when you go through that door, this is what you saw. And what's interesting about this architecturally is that the building is landmarked. You can't do anything to the building. But in the 70s, this was, a, this was actually set up as a print shop. Rauschenberg was in that, this group we were talking about. Richard and I were talking about him. Um, and at that time, before it was landmarked, they decided to do this very sort of modernist, much more landscape idea of architecture. And they cut into the wall. This, this sort of gash in that room, which was almost, I think, pretty much consistently since that happened, covered with a faux brick. Um, uh, it was actually just like a piece of plywood painted, but no one really noticed it. So I took that down. This is just a string grid on the top. And then I mirrored the walls to the height of, of, of the... Um, of the window. So you see the window here. So the other idea was that when you get to the end, to the last room after going through all of these, you're back at the beginning, but you understand the beginning in a different way. Um, this also, I think, has a lot to do with painting for me. I was thinking about <coughs> paintings and windows and um, Matisse and Vermeer, this idea of having a landscape that led from, you know, um, you know, in a classic Vermeer, you would see a map to a window to something, you know, to a, 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 a glass of milk, this kind of, um, from the, sort of the profound to the mundane in one sweep. Um, so this is a rock uh, that I wanted to, I wanted to bring the piece also out into Venice, outside of the um, pavilion. And they're actually, the, and the last room is actually, um, it's actually a place where we use as a studio. So this is how the rocks were made. And I was thinking about this idea of gravity and perception. And you know, the outside of the pavilion is the columns are fake. Most of Colombia, we know this. All of the columns are actually just indicators for gravity. They're actually decorative. They're not actually bearing structures. So this idea of a, of a surface being, um, being you know, implying gravity, but when you get up close to them, you actually see that they are not, um, they are not gravitationally sound. That they're just a photograph and pretending to be a rock. So these, I brought these out into Venice and placed them. This idea of having almost like this idea we we're talking about anchors. This idea of the, you would either see these before you went to the pavilion and realize that they were that they were part of the show, or you might notice them after. So this idea of the memory of the piece being sort of both before and after, or understanding them differently, having, um, having experienced them as art. Um, so this is, a, this is a, a different body of work that I wanted to talk about in, in very specifically in relationship to uh, Richard's comment about the mapping of uh, the meaningful mapping of time and space. So these, is a, these are a series of um, portrait drawings that I did. So I was asked, um, very early on, I did a show at White Columns, I think in 97. And they asked me to give a donation for, um, their, for their auction, for their gala. And I didn't have work. So I said, well, I'll do a portrait of someone. They need to give me 10, uh, actually dozen, 12 of the most important, in their mind, um, uh, events in their life. Um, and I will draw those events in the order that I think you know we actually remember things, which is not in in a linear order. Um, and I will, they will write it to me on a um, on a sheet of paper, 
I will take that list, I will draw it, and then I will destroy the sheet of paper and they will get this back. So it was really about a conversation between some, you know, uh, uh, the, the subject matter of a portrait and the artist and having that, um, that, that conversation, that intimate conversation of how do, you, how do you make a portrait of someone, what, what is meaningful for them, and how they created meaning through time. Um, uh, so this is another leap, but I wanted to show it because, so this is, uh, it's a, maybe it's interesting to ask, how many people know what this is? So it's a pretty heavy art crowd, probably. So the reason I put this up is, so this is Robert Smith and the Spiral Jetty. This is 1970. The reason I put this up, because I put a little section in about images. Um, and for me, this was an important image, because I felt like when I saw it for the first time, which was probably like in the 80s, that the, the image itself is the work. Because we all went, if we didn't see this image, and I asked you about this about Smith and Spiral Jetty, you would say to me, you would in your mind, this was what would come up, and you would think that you knew the work, even though you hadn't seen it, um, because this this image is so iconic. But the number of people who see it from this perspective, from the air, from an airplane in black and white, is is almost none in actuality. So even from the beginning of making work that felt very ephemeral and very site-specific, the photography itself was very important to me. And as a, as a painter, when I graduated, uh, when I went to graduate school, I went as a painter. Um, and I had studied architecture and painting. And then in graduate school, I started making sculpture. But as a painter, the, in, to these, these, uh, the, the, the sculptures as sites to make images was an important idea for me. And I really thought of them as, as how, of, of composing images like paintings. This is actually in uh, a Renzo Piano building in Tokyo, which is this incredible building. From the outside, you only see these blocks, these glass blocks. You see no structure, so your whole sense of scale is, is gone. Um, this is a piece that I did actually when I was still in graduate school in 1996 for the reopening of PS1. And again, this is the image to me that represents what that piece was like. But if you back up, you can see that that image is right here. But if you back up, that's it was done in a closet um, uh, at PS1 in a, in, a, in a water closet. And there's dripping water in the back. But this idea of how you frame the experience through an image became is, has become more and more important to me. So this is uh, a close-up of a planetarium. That's what it's like when you when you see it from afar. And this was an important piece for me because actually I was in a conversation with um, Arthur Danto and he said to me, you know, your work is less like um, architectural models and more like scientific models because architectural models are things that are built to scale up from as stand-ins for scaling up an idea, whereas scientific models actually model behavior. Um, and so I actually thought, okay, I'm gonna do something very unlike what I was doing and actually do something that was sort of on the nose, this idea of what it, what is it like to actually try and model something. So when you see this from far away, you kind of recognize it as a, as a modeling of a planet. But when you get up close, you have a different experience of it because uh, you enter it. And I think usually that image of having distance from a planet, you feel very small. And when you come up to this, that transition of getting inside it, um, is a kind of there's this kind of was this kind of incredible moment where you were surprised that you were entering that this thing that you sort of recognized as being a planet beforehand. So and this is the the light flickering is just you'll see there's like a piece of toilet paper with a light um, with a piece of paper with holes in it. So this kind of very um, slip shot uh, sort of fragile. Um, effort to model something beyond really one's capacity to understand um, was an interesting idea. This is going back. This is uh, this is 1998. It's at the MCA Chicago. So this is the first show that I did, um, solo show that I did as an artist. And it's interesting now to me to look at it because it actually had video in it. Um, and uh, you can see there are small projections throughout it. Um, and when it was reinstalled about 20 years later at LACMA, it's funny you can see the 80s parquet floor, which no one ever, oops, which no one ever would put in anymore, but the pieces, it matched the floor of the MCA. But when it was reinstalled again, um, the thing that, that, the issue with it in terms of um, longevity 
was of course not any of the objects, but it was the technology, right? So you know, people always ask me, oh, how do you preserve your work? How does it how's it reinstalled? You know, this piece was made um, with you know, it had to be made, and a friend of mine worked for Sony. He did me a favor, and we did the videos there. Um, everything has had to be redone about six times since we made it because that's the thing that's outdated. Museum conservation is most fragile, really, around technology. So, okay, this is a big leap. This is um, a photograph that a friend of mine just gave me that everybody knows who this is. <laughs> but, and this is me at age 16. And this, it's, a funny, it's a funny picture to me. I just got it, someone handed it to me, but it's a funny picture. My, my good friend who took it gave, was handed it to me a little crumpled black and white photograph and said, do you remember this? So when I was 16, which I had forgotten, I ran into, and we ran into Andy Warhol in a, um, a public school that was on the weekends being used to um, have it as a secondhand, um, you know, fair, secondhand fair that you could buy things from for very cheap. And we went up to him and we asked him, could, could we take this picture? But what's funny about it is not just for those of you who are my students here, you know, the 80s haircut and short 80s haircut. Um, um, and, it's just, and the fact that it looks like I'm Photoshopped in, I looked, at, I looked up when, when Photoshop was invented, and it was 88 um, was when it first went public. Um, but what's interesting, and someone said to me this, what the most interesting is that we had a camera with us because it's so unlikely that we would have had a camera. We were both in an introductory um, high school photography class, and that's why we had it. But had this been taken today, I would have six photographs before, six photographs after. I would know exactly when it was taken, and I'd probably have 17 of these, and half of them would be moving. Um, and so that, that, the reason I use that as an introductory, besides the fact that I think it's funny as an image, is that, you know, this ability in my life to actually use my phone and um, my laptop to make, um, to make moving images uh, and juxtapose them with um, objects in this kind of much more fluid way has opened up, I think, a whole other body of work that I've always kept on the side. I've always been making videos. Um, and I am one of those people who takes, you know, hundreds of photographs a day um, and feels like I won't remember things if I don't. Um, but I was also thinking about how photography has moved back, I think, in my mind to the beginnings of film. Um, and that we don't see photographs in, in uh, we see them in motion, we see them flipping through them, we see them in multiples, so we see them in a much more filmic way. Obviously the last video, for me obviously, is, is a, you know, it's a reference to Stieglitz, it's a reference to Egerton, there's a reference to like, you, the idea of um, the moving image uh, over time. But I also want to juxtapose um, the material with the immaterial and, and have those things confused all the time. So uh, when I was doing these videos, I didn't know how to do what to do with them, how do they become sculpture. So I just made the editing desk itself, the sculpture, in this first one um, uh, called Timekeeper. So that the chair that I was working on, and as those of you who do ed editing, you know you have multiple screens. I mean, I just did a tour of this building, half of the, to me, you know, half of the desks have a, a, a you know, resemblance to this. And then the, the walls of the space itself um, all are projected from this, from this piece here. Um, and in some ways, for me, it was like making the entire architecture into a planetarium. Um, because for me, uh, you know, for those of you who are, I don't some of them still exist, but uh, the planetarium, when you would go, there was always the incredible uh, space and the images around you, but there was also the machine and the, this, this incredible camera that was projecting it was also part of the experience um, and, uh, of being there. So I wanted the piece itself to, and, and the space to be confused. So this is actually just a, a video of one of the, one of the many um, images that are projected. And this is an image, as you saw, they all start at the same time, but they move out in relationship to how fast these animals move in space. So the Pellegrine falcon starts to break apart, you know, break out, you know, the ostrich can't keep up, you know, with the cheetah. So there's this whole idea of how do we measure time and space? What are real timekeepers in the work? Um, and so then this was the next 
iteration, which became kind of a mixture of the planetarium and the timekeepers. This is at Haus de Kunst, which is an extremely haunted place. One of the things about Nazi architecture was that they always wanted the sky to look the to the ceiling of an architecture of an architectural space to look like it was the sky itself. Um, and so when this building was built, there were these incredible skylights, which of course are not great for art. Um, but, uh, and they're all covered because the building is, there's a lot of conflict about how to deal with the building. So I projected water so that you were underwater when you came in. And one of the, the space is huge because the, the scale of that architecture um, was so over the top. And so how to actually deal with that space um, was an interesting challenge. And um, one of the things that I did was I cast a video of a puddle that was just outside on the, of, on the street at night um, along the floor so that it um, incorporated this kind of um, carpet right to you when you walked in. So this extended all the way across the floor. Um, almost like when you see the sunset over water and you see it sort of from your toes all the way to the sun itself. Um, so this is a close-up of seeing how the images um, on the paper act. And it was an important idea that they actually disappear and they die. So one of the things that I was interested in doing here is making the digital feel like a material. So treating it like sculpture, having it pixelate, having it fall apart, having it burn. Um, and this is what the studio looked like um, while I was doing that. And I started doing more and more, so you see this kind of thing that happens. So this was before I made that piece. This is the drawing for the piece. Uh, one of the things, this is the print that I made for the museum. Um, and this is a photograph. This is like a fundraiser for the museum, which I would make prints all the time. I did a lot of two-dimensional work when they were either gifts, I realized, or they were donations. Um, but I really loved doing it, but I never, but I wouldn't let it out of the studio. This is a still of the video. Um, this is a, a, a drawing that shows sort of what I was um, going to make for a space. This is a, this is a photograph afterwards. So this kind of juxtaposition in time of, of, of using the walls as a kind of timekeeper, which I think people do more and more um, in the studios. When you go to the studios, the work itself on the wall tells you a lot. Um, about um, the mapping of ideas. And so this is what, I made a secret studio in my studio, because as a sculptor, you end up actually um, working with other people, almost inevitably, because you have to move things, uh, you have to build things, you have to preserve things, you have to document them in a way that, that actually requires teams, usually. So I made this sort of secret studio where no one would come in. And it was interesting to me because it provided a different way of working. Um, and I started making these paintings. Um, and the way that I showed them was actually by, there's a painting here, a little one, um, by mixing sort of what was being, the time of what was being made with the painting itself. So then I measured where everything was in the studio and in the gallery displayed them exactly like that so that they were kind of documents of the making of the piece itself. And then you had like, this was a piece from this is the subway station I did on 96th Street. This is the piece that I'm making at Storm King. So it was literally what was on my wall and then <coughs> evidenced in a public space. Um, this was, we had made a big print of this, the gallery that it would go into. So when you see it in the gallery, you see actually the image of the gallery um, Actually, this is the image of the gallery, and this is the image of the gallery during installation. Because I think, you know, we all know this, that when you, I mean, when I see an artist, what happens is we go in and they pull out their iPhone and they say, this is what I did this morning, this is what I did yesterday. So the whole way of making a work actually has this kind of document, documenting, you know, every step in the stage. Um, and I became more and more interested in at how, in making images and in painting. I've done printmaking throughout, I've taught at Columbia for about 20 years with Kiki Smith, and uh, you know how an image is pulled from a silk screen, how in photography it bleeds out into space, how to mix all of these mediums. 
um, on a flat plane and, to, and what a flat plane can do and not a sculpture um, became very interesting to me. How can you get these all to work on the same plane? Ideas that are essentially, in my mind, painting ideas about color and heat to then play with this idea of you know, representing uh, a cold color, but then also having something that is literally hot represented in the painting itself it was interesting to me that it's a hot color, but it's also a hot signifier of heat through a, through a, through a, a photograph. And these actually, I was thinking a little bit about, um, about Mondrian's trees and how you could take something and, and abstract from that image over and over until it disappeared. Um, and this is the last thing I'll show you, which was this, which is a show I did in Rome where I juxtaposed the two together um, and played, you know, I was talking about that idea of how even with the sculpture, the, this as a view was a, to me like a very painterly idea about how you moved through architecture, how it was framed. Um, and that really for me, the, the, the paintings in some ways are paintings of the sculptures. Um, and to, but to me, they represent the feeling of being in a space. You know, the feeling of being there in this photograph is actually more representative in this, in my mind. Um, and that, that feeling of moving into this as a flat surface is actually closer than, it, than this may be, that this representation of it is, is less accurate and than that is. And um, this is just a compilation of seeing them in juxtapose, and I'll leave you with that, and then Richard can respond. to have the opportunity to hear you, to see your work. It really reinforces that Picasso line that art wipes the dust of daily life out of our lives. It, um, it is such a pleasure. You're, and it's a pleasure because to my eyes and to my brain, such that it is, you're a magician. While I can, I believe, understand that which you have done, how you have done it remains to me a mystery. And perhaps we can talk about that somewhat later. How it is that you conceive, how it is that you're motivated to create these um, spectacular installations. Uh, uh, you really reinforce again the idea that art shows us what we cannot see. It's um, really quite interesting the way you um, teach and I, I I think it's fair to argue, and you can argue with me, um, that all art at some level tries to portray or represent reality. And um, what it seems to me you have done is not dissimilar to what the brain must do to perceive the world. And that is you are deconstructing reality and then reconstructing it into a new world, the world of Sarah Z, Sarah Z's representation of the world. And that's very clear when you take um, what are identifiable objects 
and you introduce them into a structure so that those objects now lose their identity. Um, you have transformed the familiar into the novel by virtue of putting them into your own environment. And you've created, uh, to my eyes, a, a Sarah Z world that is attempting to represent a reality quite distinct from the objects you chose to represent it with. So what I think you're doing is deconstructing and recreating a new world from that which enters your brain. So I argue that this is precisely what the brain must do to perceive the world. And I'm not going to go into a, an hour discussion of uh, how I view perception, but let me briefly try and talk about how I believe the brain perceives the world. But before I do that, I want to make um, what I think is a, a point about the perception of the world and the distinction between the artist and the scientist in the perception of the world. Now, um, we have extant art from as far back as 15,000 years ago. And um, through the different cultures, the different civilizations, each of those artistic endeavors has tried to represent the world. <coughs> but as I'll point out, they do it in such extremely different ways. And the art that we observe is um, from, say, medieval times. And the art we just observed are so different. But one thing is clear. They all wish to represent the world, but the world has not changed. And so we have these very different views of the world presented by an artist. So if you consider Chimaboy and the sort of dark, um, serious Madonnas. And then a hundred years later, we have the Golden Age, and Botticelli is painting a much more um, light, sensuous Madonna again. And then you wait 50 more years, and you have Titian painting his mistress lying languidly on a bed. These representations of the very same world are so different. I mean, the, the example that I think people use is uh, Velázquez's painting of the deeply religious innocent, the tent, and then 300 years later, we have Bacon painting a raving, mad, expressionistic innocent. Same world, same image, same individual completely different representations. And the remarkable thing about art, which is not true for science, is that each of these representations, despite the fact that they are attempting to depict, to represent the very same world, are, to my eyes, completely different. Each has a beauty in their unity and in their coherence. And each of them, however different, are true by virtue of their unity, coherence, and beauty. Doesn't work that way in science. 
A scientist can have many possible worlds, but only one of them. But as a scientist, you should be interested in only one of those worlds. And that's the world that actually explains physical reality, nature. And so the role of a scientist is to attempt to create many possibles, but only one of those possibles will ultimately be the actual. And all the other possibles are false. It's a different world. But um, that notwithstanding, um, let's try and think about how a, one scientist thinks about uh, perception. Now, perception is, to my mind, an utterly astonishing problem. That is, how is it that the physical, the physical world, the discrete physical parameters of the world, wavelengths of light in vision, frequencies of sound in hearing, and the chemicals of smell and taste, can actually be meaningfully represented in a brain when a brain simply has a collection of neurons. And these neurons can only do one thing. They can fire. They can become activated. And they can only vary their findings, their firing, in two parameters, time and space. And this, to me, um, is an astonishing problem. Um, you have to represent this rich world with this rather monotonous combination of neurons. I don't know how that works. <laughs> um, uh, and the problem is made even more complex when you think about the fact that every species perceives the world in very different ways. And at the extreme, every individual could perceive the world in very different ways. Across species, some smell it, some see it, others listen to it. But Many species don't have the kinds of perceptual um, apparatus that other species have. So snakes, for example, have organs that can detect heat. Um, bats echolocate. Um, fish can detect electromagnetic fields. We can't detect any of that. And so the perceptual world that these examples um, uh, suggest, the perceptual world is <coughs> different for every species. And it is, I would argue, different for individuals within a species. And so the perceptual world could be so different for different individuals and different species that they might believe that they are living in completely different worlds. How do you deal with this? Um, <laughs> so, um, so we try and understand how one 
per se, one sensory system, or maybe two sensory systems, are actually deconstructed by the brain to create an abstraction, we would argue. And many, excuse me, would disagree with me. So let's go quickly to smell, and then maybe to, um, to uh, space and space-time. Um, which I'm reluctant to do because Eric knows a lot more about the representation of space than I do. <laughs> I've never, <laughs> let me pervert a quote and say, I've never met Eric Kandel in a modest mood. <laughs> Um, the, the, um, um, so, in humans, smell is often viewed as an aesthetic sense, as a sense capable of eliciting enduring thoughts and memories. But smell is a primal sense. For most organisms, it is the sense that serves the ability of an organism to detect food, predators, and mates. Um, it is evolutionarily the most primitive sense, and it is the central sensory modality by which most organisms communicate with their environment. How do you do it? Well, one of the uh, really um, outlined it, so I don't have to uh, go into it in details, uh, but our, our study of um, smell led to two rather surprising observations. The first was, how do you detect odors in the world? Odors are simply chemicals. How do you detect the vast repertoire of molecules in the world? that we call odors. So you do it, we learned, a fellow in the lab, Linda Buck, learned, I, um, I do nothing. Um, I'm a deeply religious man. And it's written in the Talmud that the work of the righteous is done by others. <laughs> Um, the, um, so, so uh, there are in the nerve cells and the tip of the nose receptors that interact rather specifically with the vast array of odorous molecules. And the remarkable thing that Linda observed in the lab was that there are a lot of receptors, that um, a mammal could have more than a thousand receptors, and those thousand receptors would be coded by a thousand genes, and you have a total of 20 or 25,000 genes in your chromosome, so 5% of your chromosome is dedicated to the re receipt of smell. Now, the other interesting thing was that a given nerve cell made only one, and you had a lot of nerve cells making each of the thousand receptors, and they were, cells making the receptors were distributed in a seemingly random way in the nose, but these nerve cells project back into the brain and all the nerve cells that make a given receptor go to a fixed point. So if you have a thousand receptors, you have a thousand points, and those points receive information on which molecules you are detecting in the world. And those points are spatially fixed. So you should probably know how you can discriminate odors now. Uh, an odor activates about 50 receptors, and that order will activate 50 points 
that are spatially invariant in the brain, and a different odor will activate 50 other points in the brain. Now, this is a mathematical um, uh, problem. How many odors can you detect if you have a thousand points and you have to choose 50? 10 to the 84th odors can be discriminated. That's more odors than there are atoms in the universe. So the system is set up to allow you to smell everything. And I can look down on um, <clears throat> this structure where convergence occurs with um, a fancy microscope and look at neural activity and I see just what you would, you would have predicted. Every odor activates a different spatial pattern of points. And I, as an experienced observer, can look through this molecule and tell you what odor an organism has encountered in the world simply from the spatial pattern. It's great. It's great. But there's a problem. And that is the, the mouse that I use doesn't have a microscope in its head. And so the question is, how does the mouse look down and determine what the spatial pattern is. And now things get even more interesting and surprising. And that is, this beautiful map is totally deconstructed at the next stage of the brain. It's called a sensory cortex. And what we observe without details at the next stage is this ability to discern the nature of an odor based on topography is discarded. And what you have in this sensory cortex is an array of what are probably a hundred hundred thousand nerve cells out of a million that respond to an odor, but the cells that respond to a given odor, jasmine, in one individual is different than the cells that respond to the very same odor in another individual. <laughs> so how can you possibly know what you're smelling? Well, you can't. Um, and, um, you simply cannot. Uh, and the only way that you can know what you're smelling is to somehow reconstruct, to create order out of disorder. You have to impose meaning on an unstructured representation of nerve cells. And meaning is imposed by experience. And, this, and we have some sense as to how this occurs. It occurs at the next station. But uh, why is this sensible? It doesn't sound sensible. Um, it's sensible because the meaning of an odor is different for every individual. So, um, for one individual, the odor of jasmine might reflect um, uh, uh, an evening, a marvelous evening with a friend. And to another individual, the odor of jasmine may be associated with great loss. And in each instance, the very same odor is going to have different meanings for different people. And we can actually show this. We can artificially activate a set of neurons in this cortex and associate it with a social situation 
and then come back and activate those neurons, and the animal, animal will begin to behave like it's in a social situation. But if I take those same neurons and I associate it with pain, the animal will now run away. And if I associate it with food, the animal will now eat. And so the very same representation can have different meanings in a given individual and certainly in different individuals. And the second reason that this unstructured representation makes sense is it's hard to build structure. It's hard to build maps. It's hard to build order. You don't have to do it if you're creating an unstructured representation. Now let me very quickly say that so what we have done is we've taken a disordered representation in the nodes. <clears throat> it becomes highly ordered in the first station in the brain, and then it is completely deconstructed, and it's reconstructed by experience, which I think is also the very basis of abstraction. And I, although you use identifiable objects, I think your work is an abstraction. And we can come to that. I just want to finally say that work of others, more recently work um, uh, at Columbia, has shown that this very concept of disorder and um, uh, creating order by experience is precisely how we map out space. I mean, you can't possibly have in your brain a map of every conceivable space that you may ever find yourself. I mean, certainly you can't have a map of the space created by Sarah. Right? Yeah. Not possible. Um, so how do you deal with that? You have one area of the brain, the hippocampus, and it, it maps space. And the way it maps space is you have a cell, and when an animal goes into a particular region of space, say the lower right-hand corner, that cell will fire. A lot of cells will fire. When the animal then moves to the left-hand corner, a different set of cells will fire. And when you move to the upper corner, yet a different set of cells will fire. Now, I've mapped out a triangle by those movements, but those cells bear no relation to the physical world. They're completely disordered. So if they're disordered, how do you know where those three corners are? And if I take the very same animal where I've mapped out these three corners, and I put it into a different space, I'll get a completely different map. And the map is made <coughs> by experience. And there are two components to the experience. <coughs> Excuse me. One is um, what we might call egocentric, and that is there is internal information which gives the animal information about the boundaries of the space, the distance travel. It's called idiothetic information. But it's really not enough to create a meaningful map. You need something called allocentric information. And that's information provided by the world. And without that, the map is completely is, is not robust and it's unstable. But this combination of internal information and the external sensory world come together to create what is called a cognitive spatial map. And that cognitive spatial map has no meaning for the animal absent its experience. 
And so these are two examples of where we're beginning to, in a very meager way, try and understand how <coughs> abstraction can represent the physical world. But that abstraction has to be afforded meaning by experience. And with that, we can return to the abstractions of Sarah Z. <laughs> so I'd like to follow up on that, Sarah. You first, thank you, Richard. For So you describe um, with great elegance that you guide the experience of the observer. And when you're building the pieces and deconstructing and reconstructing things, you, you attempt to guide the experience of whoever is going to interact with your pieces. So given what we heard and what you said, um, how did you come about these, or how do you think these? Do you put yourself in this position? Do you ask others to, to try? Do you do research about it? Um, how do you think about these? Or It was quite amazing that you said it explicitly, and then Richard uh, explained how the brain does these. I mean, I think, you know, I think that um, uh, more in talking about you know, when Richard was talking about abstraction, I was thinking, so what's the sub, because, you know, uh, I think um, in art, a lot of times we talk about a formal way of talking about a work or a subject matter. And in some ways, what I really liked about the phrase that I stole from Richard is that I think the subject of my work is the mapping of time and space. It's The subject of my work is not objects. It's not video, it's not painting. And so to me, it's about a kind of um, how any experience is, is, is fragile in that it's located in time and space. You know, even when Richard talks about um, uh, you know, things being true or not true in reality in art and science, I mean, you look at ancient Egypt, a lot of scientists, those truths are not true anymore. If you look at someone like you know, Fragonard, we might not be looking at him if John Curran exists, you know. Or we might not, you know, we might not be looking at futures, you know, uh, like Russian constructivism if Julie Merritt didn't exist. So these things actually, you know, how the importance of them over time waxes and wanes, and that sort of the truth or the, the relevance waxes and wanes over time. So when I'm looking at a space, um, or when I'm thinking about it, I think about it, I think, in that way. Um, Richard was also asking me, what, you know, what, what do you think about before peace? In some ways, I don't think you think about anything, actually. I think that what's, what, is, um, what is interesting, potentially, I think, um, at least I can say in my work, is that the work becomes live when it talks back to you. Right, and so even you know, even the idea in science of asking a question before you start a piece, which I think is also partially with funding, right? To have a laboratory, you have to have a question. But I think if you look at most of those questions, a lot of the discoveries, are, it's rare that that question is answered in the most important discoveries. I would hazard to say that most. That, that Richard knew that that result was going to happen. And I think the same thing is true, I'm the, the provocative question, but I think the same thing is true in that the most interesting things that happened in per, perhaps the work I showed was, was not and had nothing to do with what I set out to do. And that when it becomes exciting and a creative process is when you are so deeply in conversation with that process that the process speaks back to you. And so for me, that's the subject of my work. That's why I set up those plays, because I try and create a situation where that experience is actually replicated on, on site. Because I think that's also what is so profound about an artwork, is that when I walk into 
pronounced tomb at, at the Metropolitan, and I look at a drawing on the wall, I can see a moment in time that's both ancient and live in an object. But can I follow up on that? I, I, I've, I've been trying to understand unsuccessfully, seems a recurrent theme in my life, um, <laughs> the, um, whether there is something that is truly an abstract work of art. That, and by that, I would argue it's a work that is not trying to represent anything. You go in and you do the work, right? I mean, I, we've talked about this, I think. Right? Picasso said that there's no such thing as an abstract art. Um, you have to begin with something, and then you can remove all reality from it. Do you do that? Do you go in empty? I mean, we, talk, we, were talking, we were talking about how Kandinsky said the opposite. He said he went yeah. in completely empty. Yeah, yeah. but um, he was not telling the truth. I mean, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just going to say that I think you should never trust what an artist says. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, what they're right. saying about it is also, you know, yeah. it's suspect, right? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I would argue that both can be entirely ar argued, right? I mean, the minute you can argue, the minute you pick up oil paints, you're already that's a subject matter, right? You know, that has content. Um, the minute you're saying, right, it's a material that has content that already. So, um, but I think I do think that um, I don't think that I think that when a work of art becomes interesting, um, is rarely rarely has to do with a subject matter. <laughs> Do you feel that way about rep, uh, figurative artists? You know, I I don't have um, I know I I think actually this is what I I I love to teach. Um, I don't do it as much as I would love to have time to do. But I think one of the reasons why I am a good teacher to many people is I don't have I'm not going in and actually looking at work whether it's abstract or figurative. I'm not. I'm not naming it that way, and I, I actually think Richard has this um, has this talk about the, uh, the ability to see, to perceive, um, and kind of looking. But because it's interesting, as Richard, you know, full disclosure on how much I know him or not, you know, I, I because my husband is scient scientist, I I know him very. Um, you know, as an acquaintance, but what I saw him doing often is I've seen him in galleries when he doesn't even know um, anyone's there, and he has a very intense, uh, um, completely focused relationship with looking at art um, that um, I recognize, and that's, that's so, but, but I guess my point is that when I go look at work, I try and have a very direct conversation with the work. Um, and I have no, I don't bring to it an opinion about whether, for example, my students should be painting, should be making figures, should be doing abstract work. I don't bring that in um, as, as a, um, you know, as a kind of um, idea about what should be being made. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I, I, could, I would say, you know, all art is abstract, yes. you know, so it doesn't, it, it's an abstract. If you're going to make art to start, it's a you're, it's yes. it's an abstract idea to start. You know that would probably be. But you know when you use the word abstract and abstraction, as you know, like, as a fan of Barnett Newman and Bryce Martin, and abstraction in art has you know it has there are many ways we could not to get into semantics, yeah. but there are many ways we could talk about it. For me, I I guess the answer would be all art is abstract. Yes, I'm. If you called me an abstract. Sculptor, painter, I would say yes. If you called me, I mean, you know, if you called me figurative, I could say that too. Everything is scaled to the body. Every experience to me is to do with whether it's scaled to the hand, whether I'm seeing it at eye level, which is also a very architectural idea. You know, how high is a door? How is someone going to, are they going to be looking down? Are they going to be looking up? That's a figurative idea. 
But I guess uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just the conversation about I like, I, if, 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 yeah, I like the idea that all art is abstract. Yeah. I'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, no, I mean, actually, let me, let me just finish with that, because yeah. I think it's an interesting thing. Because Richard and I had a little bit of this conversation, so I asked him, which I'll ask him right here, what does abstraction mean when he uses that word in science? Um, it means that, to me, um, it means that you are... completely eliminating the original identity and transforming it into um, a representation or the lack of a representation with um, a completely independent identity. And I actually believe, but this is very personal, that that's what you're doing with your paint cans, and you, they're no longer paint cans to sure. me. Right. Well, and I mean, that's why I use the word specifically right. um, to describe your structures. But I'm a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think Carol does question, and the audience. Yeah, we're going to go. We're going to go to questions. I, I was intrigued, Sarah, when you talked about your secret studio, like the studio within the studio. And I, I, I wish you would talk about that a little bit more, and what is it that you're looking for when you go there that's different than when you're working with others or when you're constructing something. And then I was curious if you had a lab within a lab that you went to, or maybe for you it's going to art is your lab within a lab. But I'm, but I'm curious about this idea of this... How, how personal is the imagination, you know? How, how, how does one get to that deeper place uh, where the ideas come from? And how does one, because there's so many people in the room who think about that all the time, and how do you get there? And I thought in some way you were talking about that by creating this other space. I mean, I think it, I think different people get there in different ways. I don't think you can make a, I can't say a general thing about it for, I mean, for some people make incredible artwork and it's always with a team and they're never alone and it's a team and, it, and of course it's, it's always a team effort. Um, but um, for me, I think one of the things that I'm interested in is intimacy and how something that seems extremely generic can somehow, in its time and place, suddenly feel intimate. So that what Richard said about like it's something that you identify, you have a relationship, and then there's this moment you understand it anew, right? So that having a kind of intimacy does mean for me a kind of wondering of, like how it was touched, um, a feeling that you are having a direct conversation with one human being. Um, I think for me in my work is important. This scale shift from seeing something completely, you know, mon a mundane and anonymous to then feeling like you have an, an intimacy with it. And, and how do you create that? So that, for me, having the studio, I think, was was interesting. Did I, I mean, I think that the, 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 an interesting example is Duchamp having this private studio, because the work was arguably quite conceptual, and then the piece that was hidden was actually, you know, something that he could, that was so intimate that it could barely be seen. And so there is that kind of retreat that can create a kind of intimacy, because it is an intimate experience with the artwork. I, I won't be long, fear not. Um, <laughs> the, um, the, um, the, what you describe really um, does occur in, in science as well. That is, there is, you, you generate information. And that information either has no meaning to you, or it has one meaning. And that meaning is not correct. And all of a sudden, some another piece of information emerges. And that information then transforms into something completely different and far more important. Now, those moments, 
don't occur many times in a scientist's life. And with me, there is no studio within a studio. It usually is in conversations with my students is when it'll occur. So we have uh, <clears throat> several questions from the audience. One for both of you. What role does memory play in your work? So in, in your work and, and in olfaction or perception. So what's the role of memory? I think, you know, I talked a little bit about how I always think about, you know, I think about how you enter even a building before you get to an artwork. Um, so that memory of the space over time, I think, is, is really important. And also this idea of recognition, that you re you have a memory, I mean, what you were talking about, even smells, that you know that placing an object that has that's familiar in some way, or an experience that's familiar, will, and will will you will enter with a feeling of think of knowing or remembering, and that memory will somehow be shifted in that disorientation of the experience of the of, of the work. Uh, in perception, memory is absolutely essential. That is, uh, if it indeed is true that the information comes in devoid of value, devoid of meaning, and meaning must be imposed then that meaning has to be remembered. Um, so that that space, now, that space, that odor, now takes on significance. Memory is an utterly uh, profound uh, property of nervous systems. I have a few uh, other questions. One. Uh, the question is long, it has two pages. <laughs> it says someone... Summarize. Yeah, that's a scientist. That is, uh, I think, um, married to, a, to an artist. And although there appears to be logic in, in the work when they talk about it, um, they ask about the role of randomness, or if there's real logic, or if there's um, serendipity, do you follow your logic or do you allow the, um, the, the whatever happens to go into the, the piece of work? I mean, I think it touched a little bit on that. I think the, what happens, uh, you know, on its own accord without planning is, I think, usually what's the most interesting thing. And I think in the end, what's interesting even as a viewer, I think that's translated to the viewer, actually. That's what I think is incredible about um, a work of art, is that you can, that experience of the artist making a, a decision that is unknown to them is actually what's translated. So to me, that that's the moment. The setup is all, is, is, is you know, all there to maybe perhaps to drive, but it's where the, your trip that's interesting. I've been hoping for a serendipitous moment <laughs> in my science in my whole career. I want an Alexander Fleming moment. <laughs> but it just hasn't. <laughs> so here's a question for you, sir. Are, are there landmarks, it's in quotes, within your work that anchor and guide the experience? That's, a, that, That's for you. Yeah, but, la but the word landmark, I think, came from Richard. Yeah. That was, oh, but uh, someone... Yeah, yeah, no, I know, but it's in quotes. I used yeah. the word landmark because Richard had used it a lot in his when I was talking to him about his own work. Um, and for me, that made a lot of sense in that, um, yes, I mean, there's a, there's a, I talked a little about Japanese gardens, but one of the things that I love, loved about studying them or being in them was that they would, as you were, for an example, it would be like when you're walking down a path, there would be a step that made you look down and when, and actually physically look down and look up. And at that moment in the, in the garden, there would be a view that would be usually a super sh a shift in scale where you would see a kind of miniature garden within that garden. And so that that idea of it being a, like a land, both a landmark in terms of a locator, but also as a dislocator. 
So here's a, <clears throat> a question that's more for Richard, but then can be for both. Um, it's about the developmental dimensions of um, ordering the sensory experience. Uh, for example, do children really experience smell different than adults, or do do you consider uh, different types of subjects when they are going to experience your work, for example? We know that um, very soon after birth, uh, in model systems, an organism develops an olfactory sensory system that is very mature. And that must be its necessary for survival. The mother's breast, predators. Um, and, um, uh, but most certainly, whereas the young will um, represent an odor using the same pathways, the same mechanism, the meaning, the value of those odors will change with growth and maturation. And Sarah, I know you have um, uh, many times, you know, people of different ages, including children, uh, observing your work. Do you ever find a uh, surprise in, what, in how they receive your work? Do, the, do you have that, do you take that into account? Do you find that the experience that you guide people through is time to a certain age, or do you think of it more globally? I think I would think of it more globally, yeah. So, I mean, with, did you ever have an interesting experience with someone, a child, commenting on your work that was different than what you You know, I think that, well, I, the one thing I think that, um, I, when Richard and I were talking about what's, what's similar or different than what we do, and I didn't mention this word to him, but, you know, it's a word that's usually associated with childhood, um, but I think actually it's shared and particularly from the scientists that I've met um, here, I mean, all scientists, but is this idea of wonder. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that, um, I see that, that keeps um, artists and scientists young because it's a constant sense of a kind of innocence and wonder. And I think that that is something that's interesting to me, no matter what age you are. I think it's a great place to end. Thank you, Sarah C. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr.